I, I, I want to, before I start preaching this morning, I want to talk about my message a little bit this morning. I've been preaching on the foundation of the church, the foundation of the teachings of the church, and I have preached about, uh, let's see, the repentance and faith towards God, and this morning's going to be the my third message. There are six messages all together. This morning is the third message, and this morning I'm going to be talking about baptisms. And I'm going to be talking about baptisms in the Bible and baptisms that's not in the Bible. And so I want to do some explaining and some things. And here's something that I that I thought I about doing when I started these, and, and I didn't, but I don't know, maybe it would would kind of help the messages, but these six messages, these are the foundational teachings of Christianity that's listed here, and there are six of them. And I thought about having a, a, a picture of a church, maybe on our, our uh, chalkboard or on the, from the, the uh, our, our sound booth having them up here or whatever but I thought about having a picture of a church and then having the foundations underneath having some some blocks for the foundation underneath of these six things because this is really the foundation now I want to I, I want to say this this morning uh, there is in, in, in the America and in the world there's a lot of different Christian groups and different ideas and different things. And so I've heard people make the statement, I haven't heard so much lately, but I used to hear it a lot whenever I was a kid, when I was young, I used to hear people make the state statement, uh, I, I, I want to be a Christian, but I, I, if, when I'm a Christian, I want to find the right church. I want a church that's, that's God's church, that's the real one, as if that, there's only one church that is God's church. Well, I have found out that God's church, the word church actually means congregation. If you look up the word church and look at your Strong's Concordance and look at the, at the Greek word that church came from and then turn in the back, in the back of the Strong's Concordance and, and look at the meaning for the word church, it actually means congregation. There was one translation of the Bible uh, by the, a fellow by the name of Knox that translated the Bible and all through the Bible where we read the word church in our Bible, he put the word congregation. And because of that, the uh, King of England would not allow his translation to be the official translation because he didn't like the idea of congregation. He, People think about the church, and more so back in those days, I think, but people think about the church as being the, the government of church, the church government, and, and the official corporation. Uh, that's the church, and then we are just subjects to that, and, and so forth. But the church is the congregation, and everybody that is saved, everybody that... Uh, accepts Jesus Christ and is saved by the blood of Christ is a member of that church no matter what his words is over the door of where they attend church uh, so we find that there's a lot of different doctrines a lot of different teachings and so forth in different groups and different ideas and uh, there's variations and things from them from se from uh, for several reasons and I'm not going to take the time to go in that this morning except just to say that what we need to look at when we are looking at different ideas, different theology, uh, doctrines, and so forth, we need to look at the Word of God and let the Bible be the final determination on what is correct and what is not. We can't go by what is popular. We can't go by what uh, accept something just because it is traditional. In other words, it's been taught for many, many years. There's doctrines out there that has been taught for uh, 1,700 years that is not scripturally sound. And so, uh, 
this morning as I talk about baptisms, I would like everybody this morning to, to consider the different baptisms that I'm going to talk about. I believe I have seven of them here. And I want to talk about those seven different baptisms. And I want to look at each one of those and, and uh, let you uh, uh, just take an honest look about that and, and let God speak to you about what, uh, how you should receive some of these. So let us stand this morning as I read our text. And just uh, listen carefully what these words say. The Bible says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So let us look to the Lord. Father, we love you this morning. And Lord, we strive to be accurate. We strive to, be, uh, to believe and accept the teachings that you have in our word, in your word for us. And so I just pray, Lord, you'd be with me this morning as I bring forth this message. This is very important, uh, Lord, and we accept it as such. And so we ask for your direction for your guidance this morning in Jesus name amen you may be seated if you wish I have these all listed here and so I'm not gonna uh, take the time to go through to spend a lot of time on each one of these or any one of them this morning uh, because I I don't want to hold you real late here today uh, because of the Tracy's not being here uh, we're not going to have a meal together after service, but I think it'd be great if we could all just go to Denny's and have a meal together. How does that sound? We'll just go there and we can have some more fellowship and have our meal there, and we'll just let the church pay for it. How's that? Sounds that good should to me. work out okay. Okay? <laughs> okay, baptisms. The ba one baptism that we read about in the Bible is called John's baptism. John the Baptist was a very interesting individual. Uh, he came in the spirit of Elijah, and the Bible predicted him in the Old Testament, prophesied of him, said he would come and he would be the forerunner of Christ. And that was his job, was to prepare the way for Jesus so that uh, he would make way for the ministry of Christ. And I know that uh, if uh, individuals holding crusades and things and I'll use Billy Graham for an example. When Billy Graham would hold a crusade, he would go into the town where they planned to have the crusade, and they would reserve the stadium that they was uh, wanting to use and uh, uh, no doubt uh, leave a deposit for it. And they would make all the provisions. They would do advertising. They would do everything, a lot of things, in preparation for uh, his crusades. Well. Uh, God, in his wisdom, prepared the way for the ministry of Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist was the forerunner. He prepared the way for Christ. And so he began to preach in the wilderness. And that doesn't mean, necessarily mean an area that has a lot of trees. And that's kind of what we think about when we read about wilderness. But it just simply means a place outside of town, like a rural area or out in the country. Uh, and so forth. And so uh, John was baptizing people. He was preaching repentance and he was, was baptizing unto repentance. And that was John's message and uh, the people began to ask him about his ministry and he said, I, uh, I'm, I'm not much of one. He said, I'm just come to prepare the way for the Lord. And he said, the man that's coming after me is greater than I am and I'm not worthy to untie his shoes or to tie his shoes for him. He said, this man is great. I'm paraphrasing here. And he said, uh, when he comes, he said, he'll, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. So there's two more baptisms, Holy Ghost and fire. But to get to them in a minute, John's baptism 
was a baptism unto repentance. So that's the first baptism that we uh, that I want to talk to about, and there's not a whole lot to say about it, except that that was the first baptism in the New Testament. And then we find there is a a uh, baptism, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. And here's what that scripture says. It says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. And so we are baptized. Now this is a metaphoric uh, uh, teaching here. And what this is talking about, is, is this is not water baptism. Here in Corinthians, it is a spiritual uh, event. And when you come to Christ and you commit your life to Christ, accept Him into your heart, then you are part of the body of Christ. And I want to tell you this morning, I just want to be very clear this morning, that to be saved, uh, this is what it takes to be saved, is just to invite the Lord into your life and commit your life to Him and ask Him to forgive you of your sins. And basically, that's what it takes to be saved. Now, I know that there's a teaching in a lot of different groups in the Christian community that you have to be baptized in water to be saved. Well, I want to tell you this morning, if I understand the Scripture right, the Bible doesn't teach that. There's no place in the Bible that says that we are baptized, that we have to be baptized in water to go to heaven. That simply is not Scripture. And so uh, uh, I heard a fellow this week at the conference say, that saying that people that believe that is diluting the blood of Christ. Now, I've never heard that before. Uh, but they're saying it takes the combination of the blood of Christ and water baptism to be saved. And that's the teachings. But the Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. And I'm not going to go into a lot of scriptures this morning that I could share with you. Uh, like, all, like all of these baptisms I want to talk about, it would take just too much time to go through all of these. Be glad to discuss them later, one-on-one uh, -on -one or, or in a group. If you'd like to talk more about some of this, I'd be more than happy to. But uh, it says, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So it's a spiritual experience, and I know when I came to the Lord, my life changed, and, and the Lord took my sins away right at that particular time. The Bible says that we're saved by the blood of Christ, and you'll find that I know of groups that, uh, that teach uh, uh, how you get saved and completely leave out the blood of Christ whenever they talk about getting saved, and that should not happen. So we're baptized into the body of Christ. That's a spiritual experience. And that's kind of metaphoric of water baptism. <coughs> Let's continue on. Baptism number three. There's John's baptism, baptism in the body. And now I want to talk about, talk about being baptized in the Holy Ghost. And that also is a spiritual experience. It's called the second blessing by some people. And I, I don't have a problem with that, uh, with that term, a second blessing. Uh, so the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a special uh, event that takes place in your life. You, you say you get baptized in water, and be talking about that in a few minutes here. Uh, but the, the baptism in the Holy Ghost is the second experience that you, you receive. And I know that most Pentecostal people, that's what I was raised in, and this church is kind of Pentecostal, but it's sort of. <laughs> but we're not, uh, we're uh, uh, different from a lot of the teachings and things in Pentecost. Uh, I don't teach the way they do. And Pentecostal people believe that when you receive the Holy Ghost, that the only an exclusive evidence of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost is speaking in tongues. Well, I believe in speaking in tongues. I speak in tongues myself. 
on a fairly regular basis. Normally it's in the morning in my office when I get up, I get my breakfast, usually a bowl of cereal and a cup of coffee, and I go in my office and I, spend, I start my day in prayer and, and, uh, and, and uh, just looking at the Lord and communicating with Him. And I'm, and I'm many times, uh, I'm not going to say how often, because it's not the same all the time, but I speak in tongues at that time. The Bible says that tongues edify self. It's edification to speak in tongues. But that's only one gift of the Spirit. There's nine gifts of the Spirit, and I've never heard this taught, but I, I believe that it's true, what I'm going to share with you. There's nine gifts of the Spirit, and I believe that if you, if God begins to use you in any one of those nine gifts of the Spirit, that is evidence that you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It doesn't have to be exclusively speaking in tongues. Uh, I think most people that receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, at least people that I know, they do speak with tongues, but that is not the exclusive evidence. And, and I can show you places in the Bible where people came to the Lord, and there's no evidence in Scripture that they spoke with tongues. Uh, there's one place where there was 3,000 people, the Bible says, was added to the church, and it doesn't say one thing in that scripture about them speaking in tongues. And so, but there's nine gifts in the Spirit, and I believe that any one of those gifts is evidence that you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Let me have some, uh, share some scripture with you. Luke chapter 3 and verse 16, this is talking about John the Baptist, and it says, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of, of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He, we shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And so here is Jesus prophesying, uh, or John prophesying here, that this would happen, this experience about receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 and 4, here's what we find. The Bible says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now the Jewish traditions and Jewish practice, they had the Passover feast, and 50 days later, they had the feast of Passover. The word, pa the word Pentecost, means 50th. So 50 days after they celebrated Passover, they had the, the celebrated Pentecost. So when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly, and picture this in your mind, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now I know that most uh, uh, Pentecostal people believe this happened in the upper room. I don't believe that's true. And I'm going to tell you why I don't believe that that's true. The Bible says there was 120 of them, but if we, when we read in Acts, if we was continue to read, you'll find that there was people from all different countries in the world that was there and heard and, and witnessed this experience or this event that took place. Uh, and if you read, you'll see that. Well, there's not, a, there's not one room, upper room, in the entire city of Jerusalem in those days that would, be, would, that would be big enough for 120 people. I think this took place in the temple there in Jerusalem. and. That's where the people from all around the world would come to celebrate Pentecost anyway. And so that's where the, world, the word Pentecost came from. And this is where the teaching comes from that you speak in tongues when you receive the Holy Ghost. Well, uh, that is one evidence. And I, but here we find that the Lord is doing something very special. I believe it was a one-time event and he was doing this to get the message out that the new dispensation of time was beginning. And actually, it began when Jesus died on the cross. That's when the church age began. 
And I can prove that with scripture. I had a little discussion at the conference over that. And this minister, when I made that statement that he uh, was of the old school that believed that the church age began on the day of Pentecost. Well, uh, the fact is in the book of Hebrews, it says that a last will and testament is not effective until the testator dies. I have a living trust and when I die, that living trust is going to come in, is going to be effective. Right now, it's not worth the paper it's printed on. Uh, it's just there for the day that, that I pass away. And that's the way it was. Gee, there had to be a death for the New Testament to, to become effective. And so when Jesus died on the cross, the church age began, the New Testament. And so as we look at this, they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now I believe the purpose of them speaking in tongues here, the word tongues actually means languages. And so they spake in other languages, and there was people there from different countries all around that whole area that was there to celebrate Pentecost, and they heard these people speak and talk about the wonderful things of God in their own language. And they knew that these men, these, that, uh, these 120, that they didn't know, didn't understand their own language. And so, uh, go into that a little deeper sometime if, uh, if everybody would like to. Okay, so then, after the church began, then water baptism, and now we're going to stay with water baptisms for a little while. Uh, water baptism was a, a ritual that started with John the Baptist, and it began, uh, and it was part of the new church. And so... Uh, in, the, in the first century, as the Christian church began, you'll find that when people accepted the Lord and when people got saved, then they were baptized. And I'll tell you what I believe about water baptism and what they did in the early church. I believe when somebody got saved, if they had a, a meeting and there was people that didn't know the Lord, that accepted the Lord, I believe they took them and baptized them that very day. I don't think they waited and scheduled a day uh, for convenience sakes and so forth, and sometimes you have to do that. I'm not being critical of that, but that was, we have people come up to accept the Lord and come up and just, uh, uh, and just accept the Lord, and, and uh, then we accept them as being a Christians now, part of the body of Christ. Well, back in the early church, they, they baptized them in water. And I want to give you a definition of what water baptism is about. I copied this down because it says what I really believe and what I've believed for many years. Uh, but I think the man that wrote this done a, has a better way of wording it than what I did. So I'm just going to read it to you. And this is what I believe about water baptism. A baptism declares that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. It is a public confession of your faith in and commitment to Jesus Christ. It is the next step after salvation through repentance and faith and is an important foundation for the Christian life. So when somebody gets saved, then <coughs> they are public, publicly baptized in water and that tells everybody around that person getting baptized is telling everybody around, I'm a Christian now. And I'm, I'm, it's like he makes a, 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 a statement to the world, I'm now a Christian. And that's what water baptism is really about. I know a pastor, good friend of mine, pastors in Carson City. And when somebody gets saved in his church, they go down to the public swimming pool there in Mills Park, and they use that swimming pool for a baptismal uh, facility and they baptize right there where all the public is swimming and everything and they right in public there they baptize the new converts right there at Mills Park uh, and, and I don't have a problem with that at all I think it's a good thing to do actually we have a baptismal tank here in the corner that we use and uh, it's uh, available for baptismal purposes okay 
We're talking about the baptism that they used in the early church, the first century church. And I'll tell you how they baptized in, in there, and you can read this in the book of Acts. This is scripture. It's not popular. It is not what most people do. It is not what most Christians do when they baptize people. It's not what ministers do, but it is what the Bible says. And that's something we need to uh, take a look at and uh, see uh, just uh, the, the places I can give you the scriptures and so forth about where how this is done. But in the early church, when they baptized people, they did not use the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That They began to do that some 200 years later. Uh, that's when they started doing that. But the early church, baptism was always done in the name of Jesus or the, or the words Lord Jesus. And that's the way baptism was administered in the early church. And so you'll find that most Christians do not baptize that way. But that's between them and the Lord. And so I'm not going to, uh, you know, say bad things about them. Very sincere, honest Christian people that I'm going to spend eternity with. But I believe they are making a mistake because they're following tradition rather than following the Word of God. So the early church baptized in the name of Jesus. That's the fourth baptism. Number five, and this is a, what I, I, I want to, this kind of a follow up from, from uh, what I just said about the fourth baptism. And the fifth baptism I want to talk about is being baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now that's what most people think is the correct baptism. I heard a preacher tell me that uh, he said, I studied it all out. He found out I baptized in Jesus' name. And he said, John, he said, I studied it out. And he said, since there is a contradiction in the Bible, he said, I baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and that name is Jesus Christ. Well, he is trying sincerely to follow Scripture. But he just don't understand. Uh, in Matthew 28, 19, that's where this comes from. And Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And so they began to do this. The actually, as, as, as far as I can find, in reading whatever I can get my hands on to read about it and searching it out and studying it and everything, the first person that was ever baptized using the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that person was baptized in the year 181. It was the second century. The church was about 150 years old. When, and, but that was just one person. And most people continue to be baptized in Jesus' name up until close to the fourth century. And so the name of Jesus was the name. Uh, what was I going to say about this? Let me read my... Oh, here's what I want you to, to think about. Look in your Bible. Check it out. You can read the whole Bible through everywhere. And I'll tell you what you will not find anywhere in the Bible. You will not find one single place in the entire Bible where anybody was baptized using the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It simply is not Scripture. And so uh, we can talk about it and we can discuss that and so forth. And I can, I can go through and explain Matthew 28, 19 and tell you why it says what it does. But I'm not going to take the time this morning. I preached a whole message on that, and uh, I can do that again if, uh, if everybody would like for me to do that, and I, that will explain Matthew 28, 19, where Jesus used the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I want to read a verse of scripture in the book of Romans. I'm going to read from Romans and in Colossians. They'll have it up here on the board here uh, on the screen. But in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, Therefore, we are buried 
with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So the important words I want you to say in this scripture, we are buried with him. And, and the word baptism comes from the word, if I can say it right, baptismal. Uh, it's something like that in the, the original Greek word. And it actually means to be immersed. So the word baptism means to be immersed. And it says here in Romans, we are buried with him. And so that's the first thing I want to point out about this scripture and one in Colossians. It is that we are buried when we're baptized and we are buried with him. We are not buried with them. And if you use the words Father, Son, Holy Ghost, that constitutes plurality. And so you would have to say them. But we're not buried with them. We're buried with him. Colossians Here's a, a scripture that says almost the same thing. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So it says almost the same thing as uh, the message is the same, but the words are just a little different than Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. <coughs> Baptism number six, actually I've, I have eight of them here. I thought I had seven, I have eight. Baptism number six, 1 Corinthians 15, 29. It says, else what shall they do which, were, which, are baptized, which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? Now I know that Nick has heard this with his, his history in Mormonism because they believe in, in, uh, in proxy baptism. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, I was baptized in their church uh, by proxy, that my nephew was baptized on my behalf. Well, you know what? I don't believe in that baptism, and I'll tell you why I don't, is because people that are baptized according to scriptural teaching it is something you do after you get saved. It is not something anybody else can do for you. It's something you need to do yourself. And every Christian needs to be baptized in water after they accept the Lord. And so here, as we look at this scripture about being baptized for the dead, I, you can look in commentators, uh, you can look in, in all kinds of writings, and what people has written about this word, and it seems like nobody has really uh, has a, a, a good teaching on this, that uh, this just doesn't seem to go along with anything else that the Bible teaches about baptism. And so when we look at this, we must recognize uh, that this is something that's difficult to understand. The Apostle Paul was talking about the resurrection is what he was talking about here. He, the subject was not, was not baptism. The subject was the resurrection. And he said, if there be no resurrection, what about those people that was baptized for the dead? Well, one commentator that I, that I read, uh, and this is the only man I've ever heard say this, he said, we're baptized because of the death of Christ. And that's what this is talking about. Well, I, I'm just going to be honest with you this morning. I don't really understand this scripture, and I don't have never heard anybody else that tried to explain this scripture that I think really understood it either. And most ministers and most people I've talked to will tell you that they, just, they, that they really don't understand this scripture. So baptism for the dead. And so with that, let's go to number seven. Baptism for babies. What about baptizing babies? Because there are some churches that baptized babies. Where did that start and why did that start? Why, why did the Christian church uh, begin to baptize babies? Well, here's a story that I heard and uh, I, 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 in my research, this is the only thing that I can find on it. And that was that, in, uh, that uh, Constantine, 
who was the emperor of Rome, uh, and, and this was in the fourth century, and he declared, he said that he accepted Christ and was and become a Christian, and he declared that Christianity would be the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so, and by doing that, then he said Christianity being the official religion, that means that everybody in the Roman Empire is Christians. That was his thinking on this. So if, if there was a baby born from parents that were citizens of Rome, then that made them a citizen of Rome. And every Christian needs to get baptized, so they started baptizing babies. That's the story I heard. Uh, and, and that's the, the best I could find out in my research. And so they baptized babies. Now I know they baptized for the original sin, People has talked about uh, about that, and and uh, th there's people in Christianity that actually believes that if a baby is born, if that baby is not baptized, if that baby should get killed uh, for some reason, it's, uh, an accident or, or sickness or something, and the baby should ba pass away before it's baptized, that it won't go to heaven because it has to be baptized because of Adam's sin. Well, I want to tell you something this morning. The Bible teaches very clearly that we are not, nobody is responsible for the sins that's committed by their parents. We are not responsible for what our parents do. Our parents are not responsible for what we do. Every salvation is a individual thing for each and every individual. Uh, you have to, your heart has to be right before God and nobody else can get saved for you Nobody else can get you, can force you to leave Christianity. Whatever you do, that's up to you. And so that's why I don't believe in being baptized for original sin. Okay, so baptizing babies. I don't believe that's a valid baptism. And then baptism by sprinkling. Uh, why did they start uh, sprinkling in, in baptism? Well, it wouldn't be very convenient or very practical to immerse a baby in water, would it? So they started just sprinkling as an alternative to that, and then they started pouring. I know ministers that believe in immersion, but yet in certain situations they use what is called pouring. And instead of sprinkling, they get it like a a little thing of water and they pour water on somebody. Well, uh, the reason that ministers would do that is if there's somebody that is very ill and let's say they are in the, on their deathbed and they're not physically able to get up, they can't walk, they can't do anything for themselves and they're in bed and they accept the Lord and they want to get baptized and so the preacher does that because it's just impossible to take them to a, bapti a, a, baptis a baptistry and to immerse them in water. So that's why uh, that, and, and uh, I'll leave that up to everybody else. Now again, I'm going to refer to the scriptures in Roman and, and, and Colossians. It says we're buried with him in baptism. There's no scripture in the Bible that would validate uh, sprinkling. Uh, and, and there are scriptures that talks about people getting saved and their whole family and I've heard people say that would include if they had little babies that those babies also got saved well I, I don't think the scripture really teaches that so again in closing this morning let me give you the reason for baptism and this is talking about water baptism and the other baptisms is like metaphoric. A baptism declares that you are, are a follower of Jesus Christ. It is a public confession of your faith in and commitment to Jesus Christ. It is the next step after salvation through repentance and faith and is an important foundation for Christian life. In the Old Testament, when a child was, when a man child was born, eight days after he was born, he was circumcised. I believe that baptism after the cross 
serves the same purpose as what circumcision did in the Old, in the Old Testament or before the cross. When people came to into when a baby was born in Israel, when that baby was six day, it was and that uh, made him uh, uh, official entrance as a citizen of the uh, kingdom of Israel. But remember, he had to be born before he was circumcised. And in in water baptism, I believe it serves the same purpose. That when you get saved, then you get baptized in water. And that makes a public display that you're telling everybody, I'm now a Christian, I belong to God. And so this morning, I hope that this message is helpful. Uh, maybe it gives some of you something to think about. Uh, and I want to say this, that if, if you have questions or you want to discuss anything, feel free to contact me. I'll be more than happy to talk about this to anybody and explain everything that I can. Yes, Nick? Is there any law about being baptized twice or anything like that? When you're Mormon, they do it when you're eight, no matter what. Okay. When you're eight years old. I'm, I'm really not very familiar with, with uh, several rituals in the Mormon church, but... Uh, we just say that one didn't count. Let, let, me, let, me read a, let me read a scripture. I want to answer your question. That's a very good question, and I'm glad you brought it up. I should have included it Sorry. <laughs> in, in my message. Oh, no problem. That's great. Let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 19, and begin reading in verse 1. And it says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism, speaking about John the Baptist baptizing unto repentance. Verse 4, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So this is scripture showing where these people was rebaptized because they needed to update, so to speak, their baptism. That's what I was thinking of. Yes, I, when I started the church here, uh, we had some people from, from another church that closed their church, and I was attending that church, and I had already announced I was gonna start a church, and when I started the church, the people from, that was from this other church and had been raised in their theology, they said to me, they said, Brother John, we'd like to come to your new church you're going to start with you. And but we would, what we'd like to do, we know that you have uh, some teachings that is different from what we have been taught. And we would like for you to teach us uh, and explain the differences and why you believe what you did. So I started teaching one subject every Wednesday night at Bible study. I, be, I was began to teach a study every week on things that I be, that I believed is scriptural, scripturally sound, and that I knew was different from what they was raised in. I knew what they was raised in because I was raised under the same teaching as they was, and so I began to do that. And after I taught on water baptism, there was three ladies in the church that wanted me to rebaptize them and to baptize them in the name of Jesus. And so they was the first people to be baptized in our baptistry. We, we got our baptistry right after that. And they was the first ones to be baptized. So yes, I believe it is uh, appropriate to be rebaptized. And I believe that everybody should pray about this and should just ask God and should make a decision of what they want to do themselves and I'll accept whatever they decide that the Lord spoke to them. Okay? Thank you. You bet. 
anything else before we're dismissed this morning? Okay. Let us stand this morning then.